Hi, I'm Kimmy Berlin, the co-founder of Build Up Boys, and this month I had the chance to speak to the wonderful, smart, grounded, awesome Tony Porter, the CEO of A Call to Men. And if you do not know A Call to Men, you really need to check out their website and you need to check out Tony Porter's A Call to Men TED Talk. It is incredible. They are empowering men and boys across the world and helping keep girls and women safe. And they've just done a remarkable job so far. And I can't wait for you to hear what he has to say. He is really great. Thank you. I was director of addiction services at a local hospital in uh right outside the Bronx, about 30 minutes outside of Bronx, New York, a town called Nyack. I know Nyack. Yeah, Rockland County, New York. Yeah, yeah. so I was a uh, director of addiction services there. And it was a strong contingency of uh, advocates in the community advocating against domestic violence and sexual violence. And uh, and they began to engage me. I had a huge platform in, in the social service arena and they began to engage me and challenge me. Uh, and I, I was doing a lot of anti-racism work at the time. Uh, and I became attracted to what they were doing more because if anything, to tell you the truth, because you know, doing anti-racism work, I was coming at it from a position of someone who's marginalized where, right. and where there's an expectation for me to speak out, to challenge, you know, and, and that's how our society still operates far too often. And what I was learning about the anti-sexism work is this is where, I, you know, this is where I'm a member of the dominating group and where I'm not expected to speak out, you know, that I'm, I'm, I, I, I should be operating as, as most members of dominating groups are conditioned to be silent, right? to uh, protect the status quo and all of those things. And yeah. uh, so it was attractive to me. And I was actually able to make the link between sexism and racism and, and, and the experience of black and brown women. So it was women in the community who seen, you know, something in me and then they invested time and energy into teaching me uh and and then giving me marching orders and sending me out there I, they knew in their wisdom that and and particularly then because we're going back more than two decades right. they knew in their wisdom that they you know in order to prevent the violence uh men had to be part of the solution mm -hmm. uh that they can continue to do the good work they were doing around advocacy and uh, you know, getting laws enforced, laws created that needed to be on the books, laws enforced that was on the books that weren't being enforced, uh, right. you know, uh, better and more appropriate and effective uh, victim services and resources. They knew they could continue to do all of that mm -hmm. on their own, but that's all responding to the violence, right? Yeah. The violence has already happened. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we need to respond well, but someone's already been hurt. Right. And so to get in front of it upstream, so to say, to prevent yes. it, you know, to prevent it, they knew that men had to be part of the solution. And this is back in the early days. And now is is a common practice for men to be part of the solution. Men work in, in, in agencies that are uh, uh, women and gender focused, uh, but back then there, there were very, very few, if any. Uh, most places you found men were in law enforcement, that women were engaging with, uh, or legislature that women were engaging with, again, around laws, et cetera. Uh, but men being right alongside of women, uh, marching alongside of them literally and otherwise, that was not uh, much of a norm. What did you have to look at within yourself and how have you changed since doing this work? Well, is is real clear. I mean, I was part of the problem. Uh, and it really helped me to guide me to in the creation of a call to men in understanding the importance. See, there's a minority of men who actually perpetrate the violence. Same as if we look at any other form of group oppression. 
there's a minority of white folks who actually uh, perpetrate as we just uh, saw right? the racism that we see the 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 not racism in general but the uh, the actual violence yes. right is a minority but the the focus really needs to be on that majority right the majority of men who don't perpetrate the violence but we actually create the fertile ground for the violence to exist. And that started to become my thinking. I spent a lot of years with these women working with men who were abusive, right? right? And, and it began to you know, click for me as all of the information that we're sharing with men who have been sent by way to courts and, and whatnot to address violence they perpetrated against women, this information needs to be shared with men in general. Right. Uh, you know, and we're talking to this minority of men because it is a minority of men in comparison to the rest of us. When the truth of the matter is, we all need to be hearing this information. While I had never physically assaulted a woman, the, the information that we were sharing with the men, I have done some of that. Right. And so it, it just began to dawn on me that, you know what, these men who are abusive, you know, they're doing the bidding of men in general. I mean, when you look at any form of group oppression, violence is an ingredient and a requirement, whatever form of group oppression. So these men who are perpetrating violence against women and girls, being a minority of men, are actually doing the bidding of the majority, right? Mm, that's they're holding the oppression in place. And then we walk around and in that privilege and benefit from it. Uh, and so my thinking was, you know, I need to talk to men in general uh, because in, in the truth be told, we're creating the fertile ground for the men who are abusive to be who they are, right? In our presence. Uh, and so that was the launching of a call to men, not to intentionally talk to men who are abusive, but to talk to the majority of men who would say they're not. And, and, and by way of law or what we define as law, they're not. If they're not putting their hands on women or harassing them and doing these kind of things. But so much of our culture of how we define manhood, be it promoting less value in women, women as the property of men, women as objects, particularly sexual objects. If we made that an equation, less value plus property plus objectification that equals a culture of violence against women and girls and and you you'd be hard pressed to find a man that's never done any of that right i'm interested in what you think the link is between the power being vied for race and masculinity. I'm interested in that intersection and wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Well, well, they all connect. Yeah. Uh, we, we truly believe, we, we've historically, and, and coming from a uh, anti-racism background, yeah. you know, I, I brought that to the work of a call to men. It was very much the foundation of our work. Uh, the, what we've always called the intersections of group oppression, that they all connect up together. Uh, and so that's been, you know, very much a part of our work, uh, looking at those in the margins of the margins that are dealing with several forms of group oppression, uh, that that's where our highest level of accountability has to be in ending the violence, the discrimination, the inequality, uh, the challenges around equity. Uh, and so whether we're talking about, so our conversations, you know, go to gamut. Uh, like right now today, there are many conversations around white supremacy culture, particularly white male supremacy culture. What does that look like? Police What's the brutality. role of yeah. yeah, we're, you know, having conversations around how hurt people hurt people. Now these are conversations back in the early days we didn't have, they were very generic and kind of stale. Uh, but today we talk also a lot around the trauma that men of color are experiencing in their lives and how does that then uh, translate into violence against women and 
particularly women of color in their communities. You know, right. we talk a lot about concentrated poverty and its impact on communities, on the health of men, the well-being of men, and then how does that in and of itself promote violence uh, against women and girls in their communities and otherwise. Uh, or affect mental and emotional health. Or when you mental, look at the maternal death rate of women of color as opposed to right. white women, it's astounding. Yeah, that's right. And then even when you look at men, you know, suicide rates amongst men are, I think about three and a half times more that of women. Uh, when you talk about men and men's health, right? Uh, these are areas that where, you know, we've really expanded how we look at these issues. Uh, you know, the fact that men don't ask for help, men don't offer help, and men don't accept help. You, you think about the, the impact that has on preventative medicine for men, men's mental health, yeah. uh, how men be with each other. You know, these are all, all huge factors. Uh, back to the intersections of oppression, yeah. uh, we believe is really important. Like early on in our work, we used to talk just simply about taking leadership from women, right? And what that means in the United States of America is white women, right? right? Uh, early on in our work, it was all uh, defined by what was called feminist perspectives, but what we were really, operating out of we had left the word white out is white feminist perspectives yeah uh today we're doing a little better but we're still really challenged in being much more inclusive mm -hmm. uh, most of our organizations how human service organizations are run by white women uh it's like i i i i call it a monopoly in many respects uh when you look at the human service arena is largely led by white women uh, without an anti-racist analysis. Now, in the uh, domestic violence, sexual assault arena, many of the organization, of course, have an anti-sexist analysis, but they 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 struggle with an, an anti-sexist, anti-racist analysis. It has to be there, and it has to be there. You're right, and so this is where we're talking about black and brown women and how they define feminism. Right. And how when we're talking about again about the intersection of oppression, I remember many, many, many years ago, one of my mentors, Gwen Wright is her name. And she said to me, Tony, one of the clear differences between white feminist perspectives and black feminist perspectives is that white women want law enforcement to do more. And black and brown women are concerned they're going to do too much. And that's going to always be a huge difference in how we go about doing that work and and you can see that today that's that's very very evident today in in in, in different areas of the work uh so i i truly believe that the work of ending violence against women and girls should be led by feminist perspectives uh but they have to be more inclusive we still have a lot of work to do there we're getting better uh, because the intersection intersectionality is very much on the table uh, in conversation in many respects in policy, but we still got a lot of work to do in that right. area. We, we define manhood by far too often by distancing ourselves from what we perceive to be the experience of women and girls. Now, and while we're oppressing the heck out of women and girls, I, I truly still believe that uh, they are a lot closer to humanity than men. Men are much more robotic. Uh, and, and women, you know, they, they culturally, you know, have permission to embrace a full range of emotions and feelings and experiences. They get to explore themselves in, in ways that male socialization a phrase we coined that a uh, call to men, the man box yeah. stops men from doing men are confined to that box and the ingredients in that box that define what it means to be a man. We're held hostage to it. You know, school bus age five years old is, is like that time where we haven't already started earlier. We no longer give boys permission to cry in public. 
you tell a two-year-old boy to stop crying, you're in essence telling him to stop feeling. Yeah. Because, you know, cognitively speaking, you know, when he's happy, he smiles and, and laughs. And when he's sad, he frowns and cries. You know, cognitively speaking, he doesn't have much more than that. So you tell a two-year-old boy to stop crying and you start locking in on that. You are in essence telling him to stop feeling. And at such an early age, he is being taught condition maybe more so uh to not be his authentic self right. uh, and we we started you know when we started doing this work we originally started with men and then we started back in town younger and young then we got to college you know we have a curriculum that we use in high school and middle schools uh live respect coaching healthy respect for manhood and we just come out with a book uh, called the Book of Dares is a collection of a hundred original dares that you know how boys are taught to you know. Yeah, dares, I love that. Yeah, do that, you know. So now the Book of Dares is really daring boys to be their authentic selves, and it's I pretty love much that. Yeah, yeah, it's a great idea, and it's you know, and 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 it's and, it, and it's inspired to you know to bring re about respect to girls and and non-binary children and it's it's geared toward you know eight to about 13 years old uh, and it's, it's i'm just, gonna get it i'm so excited <laughs> yeah uh and it's, it's a pretty cool project uh and that we're we're really really excited about can it can you give me well. an example of a dare well you know uh in in a book of dares a dare would be like uh dare to cry when you're feeling sad oh wow you know? uh dare dare to uh dare to stand up to boys that are you know uh teasing a girl right, right. you know uh, dare to stand up to a bully and tell him it's not okay you know those those kind of things and and then there you know conversations that you can have with the young people around the dares it's 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 pretty cool it's a pretty cool project in all of this incredible work and looking at these intersections and in educating men and college students and even down to middle school, given your background and given the messaging that you couldn't cry and witnessing your father cry in this way that he felt apologetic, how has that, all of it, informed your emotional being right now? You know, I would say I'm much more of an emotional being in that I know how I'm feeling in a moment. It's not like it's not like you just make a snap decision and and things change. It's really really knowing when I'm scared, right? And being able to say I'm scared because yeah. in my teaching as a man you don't say you're scared. You don't admit to you don't admit to fear, you know? understanding that when I'm angry, I'm either scared or my feelings are hurt. That, you know what I mean? That when, when, when I'm immediately pissed off, yeah, I can like really, it's a pause. It, there's a pause in there that says, what's going on right now? Right now, it's not like a real serious pause, but <laughs> it becomes instinctive. You know, like what's going on right now? Like you check am in with I, yourself. Yeah, right. yeah. It's a quick check in, some self wrap. Am I scared? Uh, did what he or she say or they say hurt me? You know, uh, is is really to be connected in that way with what's going on with me emotionally? I have a gut reaction now that I didn't have before. That's incredible. You know, Where do that, you feel it in yeah. your body? For me, is in my stomach. Uh, I'm a I'm a core person, you know. I'm, I I live and breathe Pilates. <laughs> I so, love it. <laughs> I'm all about the core, and for me, that's that's the way I feel it. Though I feel it mostly in my stomach, a churning in my stomach, and uncomfortability, yeah. you know, about what's going on with me at the moment. So yeah, I have feelings all throughout my body, and I, I want to also say I'm not perfect. Oh, I, I mean, it's a journey, know. right? I could, yeah, I could life. shut I could shut it down. <laughs> Still, yeah, I still You're like, I still have stuff. access to that. I yeah. I don't want to I don't want to do that today. I want to do man box today. I want to just be pissed and operate. You know what I mean? I but 
I think the difference between me and other men is not that I got it all together. Yeah. Is that I'm not on remote control. You right. know, I know where I'm at and what I'm doing, when I'm doing it. I know how I'm feeling. And then it's my choice to, you know, deal with that appropriately or to deal with that inappropriately. And it's conscious and then you're self-empowered. A much higher level of consciousness, uh, you know, just no longer just doing tradition, right. right? For many of us as men, we're just doing tradition, what was taught and passed down from generation to generation to generation. Uh, and, uh, and that's why I love young men today uh, male identified folks, you know, at, at a call to men, we teach that, as I mentioned earlier, that we're taught to define manhood by distancing ourselves from our perceived experience of, of uh, what it means to be a woman, a girl. That's how we define what it means to be a man. And that really cr has created and locked in a binary, yeah. right? A very heterosexual, heterosexist, uh, heteronormative experience uh, and young people are breaking that binary. They really are. Yeah. And I love it. I love it. I love uh, walking alongside of them and being part of that experience of really dismantling uh, uh, this binary that, that, that we've all been conditioned to be a part of. Uh, uh, authenticity is, is, is so important to healthy manhood. You know, it being really your is. authentic self. And so we're looking at all kinds of ways, creative ways from younger folks to older folks to have male identified folks really embrace that because when we're embracing it, we're embracing our humanity. And, and yes. if we're embracing our humanity, then we're going to have a much chance, a better chance as a people to, you know, end this violence and, and be healthy as men. Do you have advice for young parents? of little boys right now, something that they could do or think about um, that you think would help create this cultural change that's so necessary? Yeah. Uh, part of it is your work. Uh, like I mentioned, our book is, is a lot of information out there now for young parents that wasn't out there in, in the past, right? That are interested. There's tons of information out there today, uh, really, to uh, be intentional in, in allowing our children to be authentic and they're authentic. And now it's it's challenging for some parents. Uh, well, you know, if they can't be their own authentic selves, yeah, it's exactly. very hard to give someone else it's, permission it's, to be. Yeah, it's very challenging for parents. Uh, so they really got to get on their own journey first. You know. Yes. Uh, and it could be equally as challenging for men as for women. You know, women are, you know, raising sons. They're, they're attempting to raise a son that's going to be respected by other men. And so they will find themselves teaching the same stuff that men teach. It's not just men teaching it. Women teach it also. Women teach, will find themselves teaching boys, you know, to fall in line with the man box not because they benefit from it, uh, because it works against them. It's just a safer place for their sons as long as we're living in a male-dominating society that, you know, will, will harm their sons when they're choosing to live outside the man box. And, and that's the challenge for us is, uh, we, you know, we're still somewhat of the first generation of men, you know, that's really embracing these, these concepts of healthy manhood. And so it can be a lonely place. And I know it's frightening to some parents to, you know, teach this to their children, uh, having maybe embraced it themselves, first of all, we can, we can manage it easier uh, with the level of maturity that we have as adults, you know, versus the peer pressure and things that children experience from each other. Uh, but I, I do believe in the end, uh, and if we're talking about our boys in particular, they're going to be healthier men. They may go through a few things, you know, finding their own niche, finding their own group of friends, finding, you know, is a different kind of leader, right? Is a different, you know, boys talk all the time about not being afraid of anything. This, this, this is really embracing a different kind of leadership and, and this whole concept of no fears. Uh, it's, it can be challenging, 
but like to see a strength in that. Yeah, and it's tremendous strength in it. Once you get beyond muscles, muscles is one characteristic of strength. Strength surpasses muscles, you know. You know, we talk about resiliency, love, uh, courage, uh, you know, th these things, these are uh, definitions of, of strength that, you know, muscles just have, you know, can't compete with. Yeah. Uh, but I, I love understand. That. Yeah, I understand the challenges for parents of uh, embracing this with their boys, but there are gifts and rewards when we do. Uh, you know, when you just look at men's health, uh, just just in of itself, when men can express and embrace a full range of emotions, we're just healthier human beings mentally as well as physically. And, and to bring our boys along in in that way, you know. I can remember my youngest son Kendall, uh, who still, you know, he, he has his challenges with sharing his feelings and emotions, but just being really intentional with him, never allowing him to give me one word answer. You know, if he said he's feeling good, well, what, what, why are you feeling good? You know, if it, if today is a good day, what's good about today? You know. Um, I'm upset. Well, why are you upset? Tell me more, you know, just really always digging in. And it's a lot of work because every time you turn him loose, when he comes home, you gotta work again. Right? <laughs> society is society is shutting that boy down, right? So you got so hard. You gotta, you gotta be in it. I've always been one to to say to parents. It's not whether our children are learning. They're learning. Uh, just because we might be silent doesn't mean that they're learning. And socialization is what you're being taught, right? right? And we're making a decision uh, as to who, who's teaching our children by way of being right in the mix or being silent. It doesn't mean he's not learning. It's just not learning from you, right? right? And, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, well, where are we at with that? You know, don't don't think for a second they're not learning. They're absorbing like crazy, much more than we did because the information is coming at them fast and furious from a hundred directions. Yeah. So they're learning. Question is who's teaching them? We appreciate you and look forward to having a long relationship with you. Oh, me too.